and get started then um, and started with this session. As Natalie mentioned, um, my name is Tu Hong, and together with Ken Phillips, our amazing alum, um, who is going to be talking about leading through ambiguity. And I think we'd be remiss to not touch on how ambiguity and change has impacted today's current situation um, with COVID, a actual pandemic, um, and also a current civil rights movement happening today, right now in 2020. There is a lot of ambiguity and a lot of change. Um, but as ISECers, um, we want to make sure that our organization rises to that challenge. And um, while this time and this change is very challenging, we thought there was no better person to help ground us in some history, um, some context of ISIC US, then Ken Phillips here, um, who is MCP of ISIC US um, in 1964 to 1966. Um, he's able to give us a firsthand account and, and really share his experience with you all. Um, so yes, we'd love to give it away to Ken. Um, please feel free to introduce yourself, Ken. Okay, hi, thank you so much. I mean, I'm so honored and pleased and I hope I don't get too emotional about all of this because it's you guys who are going to save this world. It is. It's the youth who care, the youth who are going to make the difference. And I'm just honored to have this chance to, to chat with you. Um, what did I do in ISEC? Wow. Um, mm. There it was, you know, sort of a, uh, Europe was a faraway place back then. It really was. Uh, air, air travel was not very popular. Most Americans today don't have passports and actually very few did then. Um, so it was the opportunity, travel abroad, have a job in Europe. That was the op offer. And uh, I did, went through, uh, you'll be surprised, maybe a half hour, maybe an hour orientation from the LC president who was at guiding the whole process at Princeton went out. I knew I had to get jobs, raise jobs in the U.S. So I made a list of some people I knew, some neighbors, uh, some cold calls, and ended up going to, I think it was 10 companies and getting two offers. And that was so amazing that I learned, oh my God, I can do that. You know, I was scared, really scared to, you know, go and see a corporate executive, but it worked. Um, so that was uh, that come back from the trainee ship and the previous president says ken you're the next president that was the extent of the election at that point <laughs> and i took over and you know again the, the thing was motivating students the same as today motivating students getting them to frankly get off their butts and go do things and um, i think we raised that second year well second year for me i don't know seven or eight offers and then had that exchange and of course the most amazing thing for me then was going to the international congress which was in believe it or not west berlin wow. and that was like in the height of the cold war but i'll come back to that later um so we had a good year i go to michigan to become the great supposedly great professor of global literature and get totally bored in the graduate master's program because it was all about biography and not about life. I ended up spending more time in the business school and started the local committee there. And you know, I knew a bit how to do it. And the dean of the business school was very supportive. Professor was supportive, and uh, the the thing really went off. Mm. And then the next year, um, there's a great guy right behind me who became the new LC president, Herb Bearstock, and I then organized the national conference. And the big challenge there was raising the money from Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler, and American Motors. And I did it. Again, it was the dean who made the calls and, and got the connection, but I sold organization. And I think that was a time when American corporations really did care more about students. I think they have gotten a little bit selfish in this last generation. Um, so then I'm running, going, you know, really good conference. And oh my God, there's an election. Ah, <gasps> geez, hmm, who's running? 
oh, Ken, maybe you should run. <laughs> I mean, it was so much inform more informal, I think, than it is today. So, but we had the speeches and I had my team and, and wow, I won. It was uh, <laughs> extraordinary. Going into New York, um, was scary New York at that point. It was not a very good city, not very safe. Um, but in some ways it was marvelous. My wife told me recently, you know, in the first, the years we were there, I think maybe once every four months, she and I would have a dinner together because every other night I was out with in incoming students or outgoing students or doing stuff. It was like, you know, eight, 18 hours of wonderful work every day. And I see Ian is here and you'll be surprised. And you know this, there are two of us. That was the office staff at that point. And then I think I added one more, maybe two as we went along. But yeah, we had good numbers. And I learned a lot in that process. After my time with ISAC, I had two job offers simply because I was networking. I knew people and people knew me. And one was from a very big New York City bank, Global Bank. And one was from the Institute of International Education. You know, I had no choice. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't be here if I'd taken the bank job. I would be very rich and probably not very happy. Uh, but I made the right choice. And then that led to um, job after job, fundraiser, save the children. Uh, executive director at Plan International, Foster Parents Plan. One of the great stories is that my wife and I went to Geneva after like you know, 25 years of my employee type career for a job. And this is, this is a type of ambiguity because I get there, I don't really like the organization and it turned out after a couple of months, they didn't like me. So I came home one night in Geneva, Switzerland, and said, as is the Swiss law, I have two months of salary. I got laid off. Mm -hmm. I got, I hardly ever say this word, fired. And it was one of the greatest things that happened to me because she said, obviously you're brought here for something else, find it. And you know, she had already found it with UN agencies. I found it right away with the Red Cross, with, International Youth with a whole bunch of organizations because it was 1992 and all of the 93, all of the countries and former Soviet Union now were saying, what is an NGO? What is civil society? What is a board of directors? And I knew all of that because I've been doing it for you were. 25 years. Yeah. What is uh, accountability? People actually said, we don't have that word in my language. Hmm. Then I would say, and you know, volunteers are important. Oh yeah, we know what volunteers are, they would say. That's when the government tells you what to do. <laughs> yeah, what a big shift. What a big mm -hmm. shift, yeah. And uh, so now I'm in my third career, basically, after 25 years of consulting, training with, I don't know, 100 organizations, thousands of students, a lot in Eastern Europe, all over the world. Uh, I've just been so privileged and it all started with Isaac. I've been so privileged mm -hmm. and fighting, fighting my way through the ambiguity of what do you do when you're in Geneva without a job? <laughs> <laughs> First hand right there, right? So career three is now writing about it. And as you see, my first book is out. Uh, it's about stepping up and I'll talk a little bit about it. And the next two are about strategic planning, organizational culture, and the one after that, is on strategies for fundraising. And then it goes on. There's six all together. That'll be out in the next 12 months. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. And another thing about Ken's very impressive resume is that he is a continuous contributor um, to ISEC and continues to be an amazing alumni for us. Um, this is one session he's doing. He does a whole platitude of things. Um, but yes, I, I think um, we can echo, recent alumni can echo, and I hope you all watching too that are current, current ISECers, um, that we aspire to be as, as active as you are, um, you know, years down the road. It's easy. <laughs> I travel a lot. I've been to more than 100 countries. But literally every place I go, I can meet new ISEC friends, alumni, or yeah. students. And we share the values. So they're immediately, you know, I love them. 
It's an amazing opportunity as an alum to be able to go anywhere and have connections. Mm -hmm. It's a club. Very good club. Yeah. The ISIC network. The infamous yes. ISIC network is very real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, Ken, we'd love to hear more about the time, you know, hearing about what ISIC was like for you and your experience. Um, would love to hear more about what was the world like at that time when you were a young leader in ISIC um, in the in the 60s? Yeah, I mean, it was a completely different world. It was um, the Cold War and a very real possibility of nuclear holocaust. It really was. The Cuban Missile Crisis was the closest we came to destroying the world. And it was like this close. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, you're getting me to think back 60 years. And <laughs> the 1960s were only 15 or 20 years after the Second World War. Most of the world was still recovering from a devastating war. The United States was, you know, booming. The economy was incredibly good. And that's something that's now very different. We were, we were the power. But we were also, again and again, the word beacon of hope would come up in, in my work and my studies. The United States was a beacon of hope for freedom and democracy and business that worked. Um, it was also the time of the Olympics, the very end of the century when the, the two guys who, who were first and second in, uh, I think, a 200 yard dash stood with their black hands up. <laughs> Didn't say anything, but it was powerful. And that was, of course, after huge amounts of, of violence and murders of you know, so many, so many American leaders, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy. You know, I look back on that. When Kennedy was shot, I was in Michigan. You know, everybody just walked around stunned. Stunned. It's like losing everybody. It was... You know, suddenly I realized that the, the president can be a father figure. Mm. And, uh, wow, that was that was hard to get through. Um, there was internationalism, particularly with Kennedy. You know, the Peace Corps, uh, U.S. foreign assistance, uh, but globalism didn't exist. It really didn't. I mean, there were some big international companies, but nothing like what we have today. It's a completely different world of, of business. Uh, the civil rights movement um, did lead to really important legislation after the sit-ins and the marches and the violence and the riots. Mm -hmm. But, um, and it did a lot. I mean, I, I look at the amazing number of African-American leaders today in law, in medicine, in Congress, former president, last president. I mean, it made a difference, but not enough. When my wife and I were going to move from New York City with three kids, we said, okay, we had three criteria. Um, we had to be able to afford the house. It had to be within half an hour of Grand Central Station where I, near where I was working. And it had to be an integrated neighborhood. And, you know, where did I get that? Well, that's the way we were in my family. Um, I guess living in New York helped. So my mom come down, comes down and she said, I'll help you. And she went around and talked to real estate agents. I think there were 10 of them in the areas around New York City. And she would say, yeah, she lied. She said, my husband, she was uh, not married at that point. My husband and I are looking for a house with these criteria. And the man, every, every real estate said, yes, yes, we have this. We, yes, I'm sure we can find something for you. And then she said, would say, well, you know, I'm quite serious about the being integrated. And again, she lied. She said, because my, us, my husband is, at that point she was said, is Negro. And, 
every time every time that real estate agent would look at his little notebook oh 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 no we don't have anything mm -hmm. and before they had said oh yeah we can always find something integrated you know we have a jewish family or we have two catholic families or an italian i mean it was just so disgusting yeah but that's the way it was and that's what we still suffer from today in terms of Boston did a newspaper, Boston Globe did a study two years ago, three years ago now, about education in the greater Boston area, healthcare in the greater Boston area, and net worth. And it compared the net worth of white families and black families in Boston. And the white families had a net worth, maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars. Black families, eight. Eight dollars. And this is what we did not, and nobody has ever, you know, resolved what from the back, the whole period of slavery, the time after slavery, the, the suppression of voting right now, the suppression of you know, any black guy, especially who got out of line, you're dead. Mm -hmm. I saw four of the people on the Today Show. Uh, recently talking about their lives. Three of them were African-American. And the one guy said, I worry every time my son goes out and drives at night. Yeah, anyway. Um, the legislation ha helped, but w oh, you may not know this, but when Johnson signed the Civil Rights Bill, he said, and later, we've, I heard of it. We've lost the South for the Democratic Party for decades because they were white oriented and they went to become members of the party that talks about law and order, and welfare queen, queens, and now you see the epitome of racist behavior in politics. So it's an entirely different world. In ISAC, um, the main differences were it was overwhelmingly male. Uh, it was a lot easier because there was less competition. If you wanted to get a job in another country, ISAC was one of the go-to places, maybe the, the major one. And that's why we could generate hundreds, literally many hundreds of jobs here. And it was a guy I mentioned earlier. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'd, I'd love to, to expand more on this topic. I, I guess maybe you were going to. Um, but really, yeah, you know, as you painted the picture of it being quite a different time, and it, and it was. Um, you know, there's so much similarities in the fact that there are so many things going on now, but there was, you know, so many things going on then, but it really was quite different. And so I've really got a question of, you know, really specifically, what was ISEC's relevance in the marketplace and how you know in that in that time what made isaac really a valuable thing what made people want to be a part of it and go abroad you know just coming out of the big war 15 20 years before uh, the concept of peace was so much more relevant than today it's relevant today but then it was a life or death peace issue mm -hmm. because to everybody who is an adult and i just you know, I was born in 1940, so I didn't experience the war in any way, but my family certainly did. Neighbors did. So an organization that talked about peace and international understanding was really cutting edge. And I think that made us very appealing. And then the financial part that because of the reciprocity of jobs, um, you could get a job and you didn't have to be rich. You could travel. You need your basically you needed your airfare, mm -hmm. and you would be covered when you were working because uh, the jobs were all you know pay a, a living wage that was the, the standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so so it's it's really interesting to hear about ISEC and then and now and and see that you know there's a lot of similar sort of similar issues going on, but back then um really isaac's relevancy was in response to a lot that was going on in the economy in the cold war and and not actually so much focused on the civil rights movement is that that's right right 
it was not at all focused on the civil rights movement. And I'm embarrassed to say that. And I've r racked my brain and, and found that, well, we, you know, we live, my, my wife wrote and said, we, we really live by model. So we had foreign students uh, from, from Africa, from Trinidad, from Asia live with us mm -hmm. and with our family, our kids. It was one of the greatest experiences. She told me, you remember when our youngest daughter was like eight, she would stand behind the guy from Trinidad and she said, she just loved his Afro. Now, you know, that's got to have a profound impact on everybody about, yeah, we're all the same. That was beautiful. But so Isaac was, was in the forefront. It was quite unique. The biggest competitor was someone, something called IST, which were for engineering students. Mm -hmm. But if you were in business, and the other big difference is that a lot of the ISEC leadership would come from graduate school. Mm -hmm. So, and because we had many more, we had, you know, when I started, we had 35 local committees. When I finished after two years, we had 70 something. Mm -hmm. So it was very, the, the, the pipeline of people becoming involved as a sophomore and junior, going on a traineeship, doing sales, selectively becoming an LCP or other officer then going to graduate school. And what do you do? Well, you start a new local committee. That was one of the expansion models. Or you become a volunteer regional director. We had six of them who worked as hard as anyone because as NCP, National Committee President, I was the one who said, okay guys, whoever does the best job, and it's not all of you, is gonna to go to the Congress in Rome, the Congress in Helsinki, you know, where it was going to be that year. It was a strong competition for the LCs that grew the most and for the regional directors whose regions grew the most. And it was maybe manipulative, but no, it was an incentive. It was motivational. And they were, you know, you guys are used to it because international meetings and communications and, you know, you, so many people in ISAC are international students today in this country. It's common, it's standard. This is a country that's now increasingly gonna be minority majority. I mean, like Boston is already, mm -hmm. uh, many states are going to be. But then it was, oh my God, I can go. Oh wow, I can go to Paris, I can go to Berlin, I can go to Rome. It was just so exciting. And, and it was the only way you could do that at that time. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge, huge difference. Yeah, I'd love to to pause here actually and hear some thoughts from from our participants and questions that you guys have. Um, what what are the thoughts that are going on in your mind right now? What what questions do you have for Ken up until now? If you'd like, you can go ahead and unmute yourself, or you can post it in the chat box, whichever one you'd like to do. About you know what what Isaac what was happening in Isaac? It's you know it's relevance, it's connection mm -hmm. to today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I can ask one. I was waiting to see if anyone else had one. Yeah, go ahead, Ian. Ken, I also owe you uh, an email response. So I have a lot of questions for you to ask in a different time. But um, <clears throat> first of all, I think it's admirable that you intentionally wanted to live in an integrated neighborhood. I think that's very important. And I'll do the same whenever I have a family. Um, but I wanted to ask about what was going on with the civil rights movement in the 60s. Um, you said Isaac wasn't that involved, regrettably. And so I'm wondering if, let's say you could go back and do it again, how would you have liked Isaac to be involved in that, if, if at all? That's a tough one. It's a very tough one. As you're clearly, the mission was global as it is today, but we didn't have the, the mandate that you all have today of how do you become active domestically? I don't know. I mean, I did look back and there was one predominantly uh, Negro school, as they would be called then, in Washington, DC, but it was like so many institutions, it was a predominantly white not black, not Asian, not Latin, 
it was a predominantly white male organization. Um, and it was overwhelmingly busy because of the volume of work. I mean, incoming 400, 500, 600 trainees, outgoing the same thing. I mean, I found out myself, my, my time as an NC president was basically being a local committee developer, promoter, visitor, encourager, recreator, because you know there was nobody on the national staff that I had to deal with. <laughs> There's no planning. It was all intuitive, which was really a mistake. But in in a small organization, maybe that can work. You know, we should have. That's all I can say. We should have. I feel I like it's hard, it. probably, to go back and and do shoulda, coulda, woulda, isn't it? <laughs> as much as we uh, love. People. No, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm. I wish I would say we would have changed everything, but I don't think we would have. Again, the Cold War was looming. Peace through international standing, understanding and communication was, was the core. Mm -hmm. And I regret that. I mean, personally, you know, I, I was in my next job, I, I developed a, essentially the first reverse Peace Corps, which placed, actually placed graduate students from Africa in summer poverty programs and at the end of that first program all of the foreign students were rated higher in terms of cultural competence interests you know because they represented something that at that time was really foreign there wasn't a lot of black pride i mean there was but nowhere near right. what it became at the end of the decade or what it was certainly now right. um, so a lot of my work since has been related to this, but that's the personal statement. The organization, and I asked two of my other, three of my other uh, NC presidents that, you know, recently I asked them, you know, they didn't say, oh, you forgot this, you forgot that. Mm -hmm. And it's a regret. You know, and I just hope you don't make that mistake this time. Because everything is different. Everything is different. Yeah, right. And I, and I, and I we'll get into some more, I think, thoughts about that a little bit later too, um, mm -hmm. to, to dive into that and, and take it in a, in an evolution of that question. So I think it's a, it's a very good question to set up some, some thinking and some thoughts for some later questions we have also. Um, we also have a couple more questions from the audience, um, Mateus and Grace. So Mateus, would you like to go ahead and go and then Grace will have you next? Yeah, hello. Um, my question was when there's so much going wrong and there's so many difficulties and challenges coming up, how do you keep your head up and maintain a positive attitude? Then or now or both? <laughs> uh, more so for now. Now. Lead, lead with your vision. That's it. And later I'll tell you six other steps, but <laughs> focus on your vision, focus on what you want to do, focus on what you want to be able to tell your kids you have done. And that's, you know, going to be really important. This country is on a, I think, a positive breaking point. Um, mayors are, are taking, making decisions, uh, states are making decisions everywhere except at the national level and you know there'll be a big decision in november this could be the time that really changes everything and you know i look back on 60 years ago i don't think i knew about the massive redlining where real estate companies and and banks together would say and the government we will not rent we will not sell to black people that was national policy. I didn't know that the GI Bill of Rights did not cover African Americans. Housing in the 60s and 70s and 80s was the best way for people to move up into a higher, you know, basically middle income level. 
not available. So my hope the way to the way to resolve the ambiguity is to make sure you do something more than what happened particularly in Isaac in the 1960s so that you're not guilt ridden guilt wracked when your kids say what did you do in your organization when you were a student mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, the differences are huge mm -hmm. And you'll make the difference. That's what I believe. And that's, that's the answer to, to how do you get through this, you know, the fog of what to do. No, believe in yourself. Believe that little actions are just as important, in fact, as big actions. Because most of us are going to make little actions. And it's like the difference if you go out on a beach, if anybody goes on a beach these days, and it's all sharp rocks. You're not going to go there very often but a million pieces of sand make it a beautiful beach and we need a million pieces of good behavior good actions good connections people to people like my daughter who says i love your afro the little things yeah such a such a good point i think yeah mm -hmm. i love that and i love that that metaphor of the beach that's great mm -hmm. yeah thank you mateo that was a great question yeah uh, grace would you like to ask your question uh, yes, I would. Um, so I was just curious about how your experience with ISEC prepared you for um, the real world, so to speak, and just what skills and insights from your time that you would consider to be the most valuable. Well, I, th I think you can gather the fact that I am a dedicated ISEC alum and sort of a, who cares about Princeton or Michigan, <laughs> you know? It prepared me better than all of my education because it was actual, it was practice, it was real. Um, it, I mean, the first most important thing, it gave me confidence. I can do things. I can get a group of people to do things. I can motivate people. I can lead. Oh, I can lead. Whoa, I can do that. You know, I learned I, I could do that. Um, I learned the importance of strategy. You know, what was the strategy that made ISEC really work then? And one of the key strategies, I didn't do it, but I inherited it, was if you raise a job in the US, you get a job in another country. That was a strategy that was incredibly positive and motivating. Um, I, I, I learned, you know, to forget my fear. And I am, according to all of the studies and the testing I've done all of all these years, I'm a very serious introvert. On the Myers-Briggs scale of introvert and extrovert, I'm way, way over there. But I've learned that I have some things I can do. And that really started with Isaac. You know, running a national conference. Oh, my God. Talking to corporate executives. Wow. I learned leadership from the act of leadership, not from reading about it. And that's why I'm absolutely convinced that anybody, seriously, anybody who wants to lead can lead. Just start where you are. Start in your apartment block. Start in your neighborhood, your street, your community. Start with your classmates. I talked to my son uh, yesterday, and he said that his two kids who are uh, just freshmen or about to be freshmen in, at UMass, they're on, the, on social media all the time with their friends about what to do and how to do it. They're really active. And I was so pleased to hear that. Um, you know, thinking about other leaders, you know, pick what works for you. But one of the most important things I believe is the, the core values that ISAC has. Maybe we'll get to that later, but I just want to say, when I saw, I was at a, an, a meeting, an, an alumni meeting, and it was a president's meeting at the same time in Portugal, oh, probably eight years ago now. And I think it was Ana Saliarga presented oh, yeah. <laughs> the ISAC leadership development model. And there were about 20 of us 
mm -hmm. alums from the 60s and 70s. And we met afterwards to talk about it. And we all said, oh my God, it's so good. <laughs> it's what we did, it's what we believe. We never talked about it. We never talked about leadership. We certainly never talked about values. We had the vision part really good and the mission part really good. But we said, yes, this is, this is amazing. And so there's you know, a movement that's to be further developed of the Isaac alumni activation model. <laughs> where alumni can build on what they learned, what we all learned, and what the, the, the leadership model you have tells you mm -hmm. to do. Yeah, I think leadership model is so great. I know Tu Hung and I were both kind of there when it all came Launched. to it. Used to, when we were LCPs and on the local level and VPs, that did not exist. We, we had the values, but yeah. we did not have that leadership development model. And that was a game changer. That was I remember sure. being surveyed for it. Yes. Being like, <laughs> fill up the think? survey. <laughs> and then they came out with those beautiful yeah. <laughs> yeah. terms. Yeah, it was very cool. Cool model. That's profound. Mm -hmm. That is a beautiful piece of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, we, we were entrepreneurial committees 60 years ago, as you all are today, because the beauty of ISAC is, hey, new leader every year, everywhere. And you better do what you're going to do in your one year as being a leader and then move on. Someone else is going to take over. But it's a nurturing experience. It's profound. Yeah, definitely. We've got one other question. Um, Vale, would you like to go ahead and answer your question or ask your question? Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so, hi, Ken. It's been great to hear you speak so far, so genuinely and openly about your experience. You've held a lot of uh, leadership positions, various jobs and responsibilities during a really politi politically and culturally fervent lifetime. So I'm just kind of wondering, how do you adapt to change and find the courage to lead when your environment is constantly shifting? Huh. Um, well, the alternative is not very attractive. <laughs> you know, do you want to be a bystander of things, whether it's your little group of meeting or a bigger association or your neighborhood or the world? Do you want to be a bystander or do you want to be an active participant? And that's, that's what I think has always motivated me. I was lucky, as many people are, but I, my father said to me, he was a businessman, he said, Kenny, whatever you do, do it well. And that's the business part of me that runs meetings and runs organizations. And it's why my mom, who said to me probably a hundred times, maybe I'm exaggerating, Kenny, whatever you do, do something good. So, you know, I had no option. I had to do it. I had to step up. I had to lead. Mm -hmm. And and that's, it, it's just a decision. You know, it's... It's like, I don't know, maybe this is dangerous territory these days, but it's like if one of you, anyone, sees a person, another male or female, that you'd like to hang out with. If you're a bystander, things pass, pass you by. <laughs> you know? Getting personal over here, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. And that, you know, it's harder. <laughs> Get him. Okay. Right. Theoretically, that's harder for women okay. because you're trained not to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, I, I was telling something similar to that to um, a, a, a friend from Ukraine who, who is actually stunningly beautiful. And she said, what? I never do anything. <laughs> Except, no, 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 maybe, no. <laughs> I said, That's your personal life. You got to do something different in terms of your work. You know, what do you want to do in your work? You've got to start stepping up. Right, right. Yeah, you know, so, you know, women have to be a little bit more of that, and men have to be a lot less. <laughs> balance, balance, balance. Right, right. <laughs> Finding balance. Ken, I think this actually, and, and Veil, your question is great for kind of prepping up your, your um, the next point I wanted to ask you about is, I think students nowadays, and we can kind of hear from some of the questions being asked, can feel 
quite overwhelmed with things that are happening around them with a lot of things that feel like, um, yes, like we don't even know where to start and where to start acting. And that can lead to us feeling a bit stuck. Um, can you share more about a time or an example of, of stepping up? You mentioned some, some things about little actions mattering. Um, yeah, I would love to kind of hear your, your wisdom there. Well, okay, so I, I think of two really important examples for me. One, when I was a young staff member at Save the Children and sort of a moving a forward fundraiser, um, my boss and heads of other international related U.S. organizations created a new association. And I went to the first meeting, there were probably 100 people there. And he was very strong in you know, leading the way. And at one point, somebody said, well, we need a small team to like draft the, you know, statement of mission and that kind of stuff. Anyone to do that? You know, yes. <laughs> because I knew what a strategic plan was. Yes, I will. And there were four of us who did it. And it was very profound and it's, you know, interaction is now in a very important organization. And that the same basic standards are, are what we wrote. 1976 or something, 78. Then stepping up leads to things because a couple of years later, I was a member of the board of directors and I stood up at a meeting of, I don't know, 20 other uh, NGO leaders and said, hey, uh, you know, we wrote the statement that say we assure the integrity of our members. How do we do that? And I sat down. And there was, you know, embarrassed silence. And the chairman, you know, did a good job. He said, okay, Ken, lead a group. <laughs> and I did. We got some money to fund a, an assistant, an extensive back and forth with 120 members at that point. You know, all the big organizations you know about, CARE, Save the Children, uh, Red Cross. Um, what should our ethics be? How do we articulate them? And at the end of it, we had a very powerful statement that was unanimously endorsed by all of the organizations. So, you know, one little thing, another big thing. The second example, is when we were in Providence, Rhode Island, I had chosen, <laughs> yeah, I guess I would, I chosen to live in a very diverse neighborhood, not in the fancy, beautiful place right around Brown University. I guess that's part of my life. Um, and we were asleep and all of a sudden crashed through the window downstairs and dog barks, fire alarm goes off. We were firebombed, literally you know, a bottle of kerosene or gasoline with a wick thrown through our window. It was, you know, blank, blank, scary. Mm -hmm. We were up trying to put it out. I, one of us called the fire department. Fortunately, they were there in like two minutes and nothing serious physically. Uh, and the police never cared. It was that much of a, you know, this unfunctional city. Mm -hmm. um, they never asked us why, never investigated why you got firebombed. I, you know, I look back on that. Um, so we couldn't sleep. We could not sleep night after night. Is it going to happen again? You know, totally irrationally. We could not do that. I go to a very dysfunctional neighborhood meeting and 10 people were there. Oh, we're electing our new board members. Okay. <laughs> and I'm immediately the chairman of the board and we start changing how the organization operates, it goes from basically being a complaining meeting to what are we going to do? So somebody would say, the streets aren't clean over here. What do we do? Okay, five of you get in the corner, write up a you know, one page plan. Doesn't take a lot of thinking when you're living in that community to know what you want to do about streets or about graffiti. And the number of people participating grew, money began to come in. The mayor literally called me and said, Ken, I hear you're having good meetings. Can I come? I said, no. Pause. <laughs> Not unless you bring your sanitation manager, because we have a plan that we want you to help us implement. 
we want to work together with you to make this a better city. And the mayor brought his sanitation guy. And then, you know, during the year, everybody. And, you know, so the money, which is a measurement, grew from, you know, $3,000 to a couple hundred thousand dollars that first year. Then we left, literally, after just a, a, a year of running that organization. But they continued the system of involvement and a culture that's positive. And they sent me a report two, three years later. Yeah, we just got our last second million dollars. We're doing pretty well. And I went and visited them a couple months ago and well, right before the virus set in and they're doing amazing things, amazing things. So little actions get to be big results. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense for me when I hear that because you know, when things get overwhelming, I feel like I and probably a lot of other people tend to try to think of what are the big solutions to fix everything. <laughs> and, and I think that can get us really turning our wheels and really stuck. And I, I love the, the thought of just, just do some little actions because that will at least get the flywheel spinning again. Um, yeah. We'll get things going in, 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 any, in some positive direction again, if you can just influence your little, little space because we are all kind of responsible. Yeah, for... There's a guy in that community who hated graffiti and graffiti is not art. It's gang yeah. saying, who controls drugs and prostitution on this street? So graffiti is not a very nice thing. And it was all over in that neighborhood. And he got passionate. He picked out one little thing. He said, okay, who wants to join me? Two people, eight people, whatever. Every Saturday morning, he went around and maybe on one street, dealt with one house, two houses, three houses, painted over, talked to the owner, gave them education. Um, a year later, no graffiti, none. Mm -hmm. One person did that. Saturday morning, and I was in Bucharest, and I love Bucharest, uh, at an Airbnb, and it was a beautifully restored apartment, but outside was really scary, covered with graffiti, bad lighting, and I told the person I was renting it from, you know, I would never bring anyone in my family here. It's just not comfortable, and she said, oh, the government should do something. That's not the model I believe in. In this country, we've said, let the government do things. And we see how in terms of racism, they have done pretty bad, pretty bad over the years. And it's really an amazing civil rights revolution in a really good sense of that happening right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really, really, a, I think a, an, an insightful point of, not waiting for permission to act <laughs> either. Right. Um, yeah. Sometimes yeah. I feel like we have to, we feel like we have to. And the truth is that we really don't actually, we have a lot of influence and power in our own seats. Can I talk about the Titanic? Yeah, yeah. I'd love to hear that. Ah, so what happened on the Titanic? Seriously, what happened? Well, we all know the story, if at least almost everybody saw the movie. <laughs> and the ship left, and I think it was three days later, sank. 700 people died. Why did 700 people die? Who was responsible? Was, the captain was asleep. He wanted to set a world record. That's all he cared about. The, the two lieutenants who were with binoculars saw a funny white thing in the distance, didn't know what it was, didn't worry about it, didn't want to bother the captain. The guys who were supposed to do the uh, safety uh, you know, trials never, never talked about safety to anybody. It was unsinkable, right? Just like this country is perfect, right? Um, they never ran the, the lifeboats. They didn't know if they worked or not, and they didn't. Uh, they didn't check the, the you know, the, the compartments, how it was, was, was a pump, where the pump, was it leaking anywhere? The people who made the boat were responsible. Everybody was responsible. That's my point. Everybody was responsible. And that led, you know, if people had, anyone had said, hey, captain, 
you know, let's do this. And that's what our world needs is more people who step up and say, I am responsible. You know, it's us, it's us. Otherwise I'm a bystander in life. And what good does that do? You may get a great education, you may get a good job, but you don't want to be a bystander in important things. And that's actually what we felt we were not. We were not bystanders in the Cold War. We were fighting for freedom, democracy, and free enterprise. That was our passion. And freedom and democracy, you know, are still really, well, even more important, I think, because freedom is in, is, is in decline in many countries. Democracy is in decline in many countries. Um, corporate responsibility is in decline in many countries. So they're the same values, the same priorities. When I, I was privileged to, to meet Jean Choplin, who's one of the initial founders of ISAC in 1948. And the last time I saw him, he it was a big meeting and he gave a talk about how, you know, how they did it in the early days and what their meetings were like. And then he walked off the podium and he came back after about 10 steps and said, and you know, I think, I think we made a difference in peace in Europe. I think we did. Yeah. Pretty incredible. That's pretty. It gives me goosebumps. I feel yes. in time and it's amazing. <laughs> yes. yes, and you are you all can do the same. That's the beauty. And it's you know, it is your world. It's not my world, certainly. It's not your parents' world either. It's your world. Talking with my two of my grandchildren who were in their teens a year ago, they almost started crying when they talked started talking about the oceans and plastic in the oceans and how the oceans are going to be, you know, swamps of horrible stuff and dead fish in 30 years, unless we do something. Mm -hmm. So when I had my birthday party, um, there were about 20 family members and I said, okay, time for a little serious work. And I asked three of my grandkids to run small group meetings. <laughs> the objective is what do we as a family do to combat global warming and they did and they gave a report <laughs> and uh, I think it, it boils down to about six things some of them were obvious you know shop local farmers market um, repurpose plastic um, become involved that's the one I really loved be part of a movement Mm -hmm. And my older brother said, hey, you know, I stopped using those, those coffee makers where you, you know, put it in and throw it out after each time. Yeah. I'm small. But a million people doing small things. Right, right. And I love that you, yeah. your family, that your response to your family and kind of similar to what that neighborhood organizer said to you. And it's just that same, like, if you have, if you notice a problem, turning a complaint into an action plan. And if you can do it with children, certainly we can do it now as ISECers. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and just like all those passengers on the at Titanic, they couldn't wait. And NGOs can't wait. And ISEC can't wait for something really suddenly being safe. Nobody can wait. What is your value? Not to decide? To be a bystander? Right. Being what do you want to be? Is also yeah. a decision. Who do you want to be? Ah, there. That's who you want to be. <laughs> and the amazing thing about ISAC is that that's what enables you and facilitates you and trains you. And there's a, what, 70 year history of that now. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. I'd love to go actually to back to the audience. Um, I think we, we, you know, talked about um, how you've been able to balance um, 
conflicting and lots of different change and, and challenges. Um, but I think this is a good point to kind of bring it back and, and hear from everyone. What are some of these like you're saying, Ken, what are some of these um, things that you can do that you can already start to identify? Um, yeah, would love to kind of hear from everyone. What, um, what first, what would, what can Isaac do? Mm -hmm. The world that we are seeing today, um, everything going on, what is within the scope of our organization? Um, what are ways that we as an organization with the products that we have, with the value that we have, with the resources that we have, um, the things that, that fit um, into our mission. And then you as an individual, which is mm -hmm. a totally other side of that coin of what are things that, some things that you can do. Um, so would love to, you know, have you all, like feel free to type and chat. Um, some, and we have some examples too. Um, again, what are some things that Isaac can do? And what are things that you can do? Um, and feel free to use the chat, but we'll allow, you know, just collect well, your thoughts. Like to speak to. <laughs> yeah, feel free to unmute too at any point. Um, you know, part of it is we'd love to just hear ideas and because I think each of you individually will have something unique that, you know, some unique way after hearing this presentation and after thinking a bit more about it, you know, what, what you see as opportunities uh, for ISEC and what ISEC's contribution to the world is, what its place is and how you guys want to affect it and the kinds of change that you'd really love to make. Um, mm -hmm. There's, there's really so many, so many different kinds of avenues um, you know, but keeping aligned with, with our, our mission and our vision and our values. And then, you know, that it, it really does help. I think when I think about things to help me focus and, and, you know, as I could think of so many ideas of <laughs> things that could be done in the world to help things, help problems in the world. Um, and I love that Isaac has such a focus on leadership development and, you know, humankind's potential. And so thinking within the, you know, that sort of a lens is really interesting. And I know we are certainly interested to hear what, what ideas you guys have. Right. Can I just share one model? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I think this is the situation that ISAC finds itself in. Um, in the 60s and 70s, IBM was the dominant um, machine company. And the way they ran things was top down, everywhere. And it was brilliant until Apple and you know a whole bunch of other laptop thing you know came up and IBM was heading to go out of business and their top-down leadership didn't work so they really decentralized and it worked because then they became I mean the ideas flowed up from the bottom and again and again in my work I found that really putting the people who are doing the work at the top of the pyramid, not the board of directors, not me as an executive director, but the people who are doing the work, who are in contact with customers or donors or universities or you know the outreach, they know things that no boss can possibly know. Mm -hmm. And it worked for IBM, and it certainly has worked again and again in my career. So I turned the hierarchy upside down and that's a good leadership principle too yeah i think and that i think even opens up a whole another layer <laughs> of ideas when i think about it in that lens i think you know it's, it's again it's this not what are the big boulders that i could think of you know solutions for the whole country or the whole organization but what can i do in my lc and, and for me personally i think you know what can i do as an alumnus and a board member and you know like how can how can i even contribute and do my little tiny bit <laughs> from my seat you know um you know that was definitely something that got to hung and i really excited to do this project <laughs> for everybody mm -hmm. you know something you know sort of bite-sized still you know it's mm -hmm. not up you know, overhauling the whole education of ISEC or something. <laughs> but let's provide something cool and fun and neat for you guys. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the newspapers are full of 
ideas about what to do. And, and one I read this morning from by Stacey a Abrams from Georgia, mm -hmm. who is a potential vice president uh, nominee. She said um, her philosophy is political change is protest plus participation. So talk plus action. And that's those are two fundamental leadership qualities. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Molly, that's a great idea. Starting conversations on tough subjects. I yeah. think a very relevant one now. And I know there's so many people having tough conversations all over. Um, everybody's having to do it, I think, on some level. And I think that's a great, great way to start. Right. Opening right. up a dialogue about it, even with an ISIC, you know, whether the, you know, you know, who knows how action oriented or involved I said gets. I, I love this idea of starting conversation and teaching people how to talk about in tough conversations, which speaking mm -hmm. of, there is actually a workshop that we've got <laughs> led by Eric Anderson, all about how to have difficult conversations. So mm -hmm. um, that might be something you guys take as a first action and mm -hmm. go attend that session, learn a little bit of some tactics of how to do that. That's mm -hmm. a great idea. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And what you just said, Ken, about participation, I think about um, something that I think a lot about in like my current job is um, what can I do in my seat? Um, it might feel like this is an impossible problem. It's this huge boulder we have to move. Um, but I do have influence. And I think all of you all listening in is, you have influence as as students believe it or not people want to hear what you have to say um, and just the mere fact that your current students is leverage you can use um, and, the, and then on top of that to say that you're a leader in a nonprofit um, and you're getting this amazing experience mm -hmm. um, on top of your schoolwork and so um, I think you'd be surprised at how much you you can do and it might it might feel small um, but those things add up yeah, it's what Wendy was talking about earlier. Influencers, new trend. Doesn't have to be massive scale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you have a lot of channels to do it, certainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, you know, and then you guys think about, you know, and you can do this more on your own time too. And this may be a nice follow up action item for you guys to take from this space is, is to keep pondering this question. I think it, and, you know, Go and have individual conversations with each other. Um, the, those of you who have attended this session or start them with your LCs and talk about and answer these questions for yourselves and you know what 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 could we be doing in ISIC and what could I be doing personally? I think it's, it's a cool dichotomy to think about in those in those ways. Um, I think this this makes me feel like a this is a really good tool also in those times that you're feeling stuck or overwhelmed is just start making a list of what could I do? <laughs> and then something, something may stick. <laughs> There's a really neat organization that is connected with, with ISAC alumni and I think with ISAC called the Barrett Value Center. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and they did a major study. Um, what's new given the COVID crisis? And just people said the employee experience went from, this is the past, performance, control, hierarchy. That's what the world was like before. What is it now? People said people focus, adaptability, and working together. Wow. <laughs> wow. And, yep. And then shift in personal values. Four things that really became important. Making a difference, adaptability, well-being, and caring. Hmm. Wow. That was beautiful. This is from people. Amazing. Yeah. You know, not from leaders, but from real, real people. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. It's amazing to see those things. It's like those are a lot of my thoughts, and it's cool to hear that there's. It's more widely adopted than maybe I think. <laughs> How can ISAC make a difference? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Within the broad framework of mm -hmm. your history, which I think is, well, it's very broad. Peace and fulfillment of humankind. Mm -hmm. Right. Do we have any issues like that in this country? <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. We spoke before about intercultural understanding being an Isaac value and an, and part of our mission. And how relevant is that here within our own backyards? 
Yeah. You got to know people before you understand them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. So, you know, you talked a little bit earlier about, um, you know, leading with vision, Ken. I would love to hear more of your thoughts about that, um, you know, because these times, you know, it, I, I love, you know, seeing and looking back and seeing your story that you were able to accomplish so much during your term and so much growth and so much, you know, with not very many people, you know, you had a small team, you had all these things, but there was still a lot of change and all these things going on. And how were you leading with vision? And, and what are your thoughts, um, you know, a little bit further about that, that topic and through change? Hmm. I mean, everything is change, particularly if you're a leader, because if you don't have an idea for change, then you're happy with what is. And, you know, that can't be in the world today. So, you know, the question is, how do you manage change? And I, this is, you know, there are a lot of, I mean, I've taught this, I've done courses on it, but it really comes down to just a few simple things. And um, this is my eight steps, but really I can summarize them in three. <laughs> Articulate a vision that motivates and a mission that gets results. That's the leadership communication and vision. And then you know, do the planning, do the communication. And then number four, I think is the second most important thing in addition to your vision. Don't talk about change. Seriously, change is scary. Talk about the end result. And then, you know, involve and establish and monitor, but lead with a vision and manage for results. Whatever that is getting graffiti off neighborhoods, buildings, um, getting your street to have a, a network so in case anybody needs help to go to the grocery store, you have it. You know, there are little things and they're big things where these are all changes. Yeah, mm -hmm. easy to get lost in the change, I think. You, st you stay in that realm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, are you still getting feedback on what can ISAC do? We actually just got another one. Um, Serena says, you know, in relation to starting conversations on, on tough subjects, she suggests reflecting on your own values and seeing what you can change within yourself is really important. I totally agree. Be, you know, tuning into yourself and who mm -hmm. you are, you know, that's, that's definitely part of the leadership development model of ISIC also. Um, you know, witnessing the Black Lives Matter movement has made her realize how rooted in racism Filipino culture is. Um, she's Filipino, that's <laughs> you don't know. Um, and now she's starting to realize that the values she grew up with are not necessarily the ones she wants to grow, continue to grow with. Um, it's a lot easier said than done, but with growth comes much needed change within yourself and within society as well. Um, wow, thank you so much for sharing that, Serena. Um, we really appreciate that. I, I love that. There's, there's so much in there, and I, I love that you were able to share your experience. Even, even that is, is a part of starting the conversation, and, and I love that, that it's rooted in connecting back to who you are, you know, authentically and your values, and I think that also ties really in well to this, your, your personal vision. You know, there's a vision that you have, you know, for Isaac, and also vision that you have for yourself and your life and the world and everything, and I, I love that connecting to that, I think, is, is a really great place to ground yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes, snaps. snaps. In, in all my strategic planning, the three most important components are your vision, your mission, and your values. The rest will flow from those three principles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have a vision, which is peace and fulfillment of humankind. Mm -hmm. You have your values, which I think are some of the most beautiful, powerful, unifying values i've ever seen mm -hmm. right yeah your mission you know it's changing it has to change you're not going to have international exchange programs in 2020 and maybe not in 2021 we don't know we don't know and we won't know and some of the results of you know returning viruses in 28 states or something mm -hmm scary right. so what do you do because if you don't do something if you don't have a mission 
you're not living your values and you're not even beginning to think about achieving your vision. So what is your mission in the United States today or domestically? Mm -hmm. What is it? Yeah, and I think, I think that really speaks to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ken. Does that come from the board of directors? Maybe, does it come from Ian and Renee? Yeah, maybe, but not enough. It comes from 100 mm -hmm. people, because 100 people are smarter and more innovative than any two people can possibly be. And from my conversations with Ian and Renee, I, you know, they're, they're open to innovation coming from local committee levels. And that, by the way, continues a trend of the last 10, 12 years after the bad times in 2005, 2009, and local committees become more and more important as each year passes. And that's really good because that's where they are. That's where they should be. I didn't raise any traineeships as national president. But hundreds of other people raised hundreds of them. Yeah, it's amazing. And I, I love this, 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 you know, watching you kind of walk it down all the way from the top and all the way down to the bottom. And I think you can, you know, I, I found personally for me helpful when I was LCP and, and just in general, dealing with so many things going on and just the stresses of college and Isaac and all that, like I grounding myself in my personal vision helped me lead my local committee better and helped me develop a mission or a vision, sorry, that that really inspired myself to keep right. leading my local committee. And and then in turn, what that does is it it allows people to relate to me and connect to me and to see me. And I'm not just somebody who's telling them what to do and you should do this and you should do that and I need you to do that. It's they wanted to and and that that makes a, a really big difference for the people who are, you know under the leaders and the people who are, you know, I mean, and by title, I mean, <laughs> you know, um, of course, everybody really can be a leader. Can I share a few thoughts on, on stepping up? Yes. yes, please. Because it is, what are your human values? What are your values as a human being? And this is what I've concluded after my 55 years in the NGO world. Um, a lot of it is from the fundraising perspective, but it's also from seeing how people behave. And most people, you know, the first thing obviously is take care of yourself. You have to do that. The second one, I'd say almost everybody does, which is caring for family and those close to us, your neighbors, your family. That's good. And that's the way Americans spend 98% of their money, themselves and their family. That's the startling thing. The next level, and this is the fundraising concept, but also a behavior concept, is caring for others, others in need and for our planet. And the embarrassing thing about philanthropy in this country is that for decades, it's only about 2% of national income that goes to helping others. Is, you know, volunteer time probably, you know, doubles that or triples that, but that's not enough. Um, but then at the highest level, and this is simpler than Maslow, because I don't understand some of Maslow's terms, but <laughs> people who help others make a better world are at the very highest point of being a human being. And those are, well, a lot of people, it's the teachers, it's the people we've seen who are essential in the last few months. Right. It's the healthcare workers who are putting their lives at risk. It's all of the NGO workers. And in many ways, it's all of the moms of the world. And a story that it, when I worked at Save the Children, I was really lucky because I had close connection, good friendship with a number of people in our domestic program in inner cities, Hispanic area, and in four or five or six Native American areas. And Lloyd Owl told me the story about the good wolf and the bad wolf. And 
the grandfather is sitting down, the granddaughter comes up and says, Grandpa, you told us a couple of years ago that everybody has a good wolf and a bad wolf. What, what's that mean? I'm confused. And the grandpa thought for a minute and said, yeah, that's what I told you. Everybody has a good wolf and a bad wolf. Now the little kid is saying, what? But, well, grandpa, what do they do? He thought, said, yeah, they fight. They fight in you, they fight in me, they fight in everybody. Now the kid is getting really mystified. And, and she says, after thinking, but grandpa, who wins? Who wins that fight? And he says, the one you feed. And that's why people at the top of this pyramid who are feeding the good wolves in millions of people, NGO workers, ISAC workers, are making a huge difference in the world. Mm -hmm. Just two more things I want to share. Yes. And I, I only wrote this down recently, I mean, a couple of years ago, and it's in my book but six simple steps that everybody can do. And the first one is networking. It sounds simple, but you can't lead without a network. You need colleagues, you need partners, you need allies. And it's so easy to do because that's what relationship, friendship, meetings, everything is all about. Build a network. And you're, as students or young alum, you're at a time in your life where you can build a huge network and keep in touch with them the way I couldn't back when he only had telephones and letters. Okay, second big thing for leadership is very simple. See what needs to be done. And that's what we, you've been talking about just now. What needs to be done? And that's an open question, a very, very important. So it's getting your focus. Okay. As Stacey Abrams said, it's not just marches, it's also action, participation. It's seizing an opportunity, changing something in your neighborhood, changing something in your local committee, in your university. Four, you're gonna hesitate. Step up, keep going, never slow down. And there will be roadblocks, the people who say you're crazy, People are doing horrible things on social media today. Ignore them. Keep going in spite of the roadblocks. And then the last one is so simple, but it is profound. Run a meeting well. Start on time, end on time. Have a clear agenda. Get people to participate, especially those who don't talk right off. Find a, And then go through this. See what needs to be done. <laughs> get a decision and make the meeting worthwhile. And this is something that everybody can do. Everybody. Everybody. So six leadership values and attributes. And this goes back to, you know, what are you leading? You're leading to, to make something change. Don't talk about it. Just do it with your vision. You know, Martin Luther King said, I have a dream of being at the top of the mountain. Brothers and sisters, black and white. That is probably the most important phrase I've ever heard in my life. Mm -hmm. High goals, motivating others. And then the support of the nurturing leader. Um, and this is important. But you also have to have good values, which if you follow the ISAC values, you do. And there are a lot of leaders who are powerful leaders in the world today who don't have character and don't have values. And that's scary, but it's important for all of us to, to have those. So these last two slides are, you know, my, the essence of what I say in Make a Better World, because we can. Just getting all those pieces of sand on the beach or getting the river to flow right or doing the right thing. Um, it's up to us. It's up to every single person.
I've had grandkids all the time on social media promoting what they believe. And I know what they believe is really good. Yeah, these, these models are so actionable. Um, I love, I love them. <laughs> yeah, seriously. You know, and, and they're, they're very succinct and, and kind of poignant. I really do think, I mean, I, I agree wholeheartedly with all of these. I, it's just, yeah, I, I love, I love these things. And I think, you know, if you guys take anything home, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things to take home from this session, right. but you know, these are some really, really easy things for you to do these, these six steps. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, you could just probably have these on repeat in your head all every day. <laughs> it's like, have I done all these things today? Mm -hmm. And you probably be set up for success to be a pretty strong, mm -hmm. uh, and engaging leader. Um, Mm -hmm. and get through these times that are crazy when you haven't seen anybody in months and you you know and you've got but you've got all these protests going you've got everything going on so many things going on that if yeah I think this is a good place mm -hmm. I can imagine for me at least this is a good place to ground mm -hmm. myself and um keep moving forward and and keep yeah you make me happy to hear you <laughs> I think and I've seen it work in culture I mean uh, scores 50 60 countries yeah it's really mm -hmm. simple skepticism. there's skepticism at first oh i'm powerless is the main attitude of skepticism mm -hmm. but you're not nobody's powerless you're not gonna yeah you know, we're not gonna be i don't know who are good you know famous leaders anymore we're not gonna be george washington or abraham lincoln or gandhi but we're gonna make a difference when we want to yeah right and i think what's really inspiring to me is and definitely highly recommend everyone to check out your book too mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. that good. now to now to know you and hear from you and to hear about your isaac experiences and personal experiences attached to these each of these steps you can really see that your these tips these models have very real stories attached to them and that's what we are hoping to show you all um is to to give you a little insight behind who is the man behind these steps. Um, and I think like Natalie said, having these steps kind of on repeat in your head and know that one day you're going to have these stories and this is the moment to create those stories and these steps you're going to like, these are things that can guide you and, and stories like Ken's stories like mine and Natalie's can inspire you that other people have been in your shoes before um, and are rooting for you. And I think that's that's the pretty cool part is that, um, yeah, we hope one day y'all will be the book writers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And in case you're wondering, the two signs behind me are <laughs> all about love and calmness. Those are very good. Tranquility. Ones. But let, can I tell one more story? It's when I was working with the Alzheimer's Society in Timisoara, Romania, and the Executive director said to me as we were planning their plans for the next few years, she said, the mayor is so terrible. He never will help us. I ask him for money every time I see him and he always says no. Said, okay, Aurora, that's her name, Aurora, let's go see the mayor tomorrow and do something different. Don't ask him for money. Instead, ask him what his dream for his city is. What does he want to do? So she goes in and the mayor is, you know, <clears throat> sour face, closed body language, his, his two or three aides are copying him. And so she says in a very, you know, open voice, Mr. Mayor, we're here to ask you, what are your hopes for your city? How do you want to treat, have older people in the future? How, what, should, what should the city be like for them? And his body language, it was amazing. His body language completely opened. And his two assistants, you know, obviously immediately copied him. And he started telling about his dreams, about what he wanted to do in his city, how he wanted to make a really great place for old people to live. And at the end of a very dynamic, you know, half hour back and forth planning ideas, um, he said, Aurora, come back tomorrow. So we go back the next morning and um, he says, I'm, you th I thought you were going to ask me for money, but you asked me what my dreams are. And so here, you know, 
here are the keys <laughs> to your new building. And I was so happy because, you know, she, she got her dream. She got what she wanted. And then we went to look at the building and, and I almost cried because it was a building in total disrepair, totally unusable. Everything was broken. And I am, oh my, I, maybe I did have tears coming down. But she looked at the building <laughs> and it still gets me. She said, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. Because she saw what it would be. Right. You know, exactly. vision, right there. Right. And I went back two, three, three years later, and it was. The mayor got employees to help. Some money came here. You got companies to give materials and desks and whatever they were needed. People helped, landscape, everything. It was beautiful. And this goes through everything. What are the dreams of people in the meetings you're running, in the network you're creating? What are the dreams of the other people you're in connection with? And how can you help them make those dreams come true? And that's what leadership is all about making dreams come true. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Wow, I love Ken, that so <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's so good. Wow. Oh. Man. I know. Awesome. I just, now <laughs> that I'm, and really, I, I think being able to see at a, a room of rubble and say and see a vision and not all the challenges and not all the change that you have to do and all the work it takes i think that's that's leadership and that's what isaac is activating in young people you got it you got it make dreams come true yeah we have a national dream at least most of us for a post-racial society i mean it's a long way to go but right yeah. I mean, I know my my daughter's law is African American. My grand well, one of my grandkids is African American Vietnamese. I am so much richer in my life because of that. So reach out, friends, family. Yeah, such a power in cross cultural understanding and in, in all kinds of realms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, in our earlier talk, I told you that research about people who have intercultural relations are more creative mm -hmm. because your minds are more open to, to completely different universes. Mm -hmm. So ISAC is great for that. Yes, definitely. Definitely a good place for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we are reaching the top of our session now. and. Um, I don't know if Ken has, has said earlier, he would be okay to stick around a few minutes longer if you guys have a couple more questions to answer. Um, does anybody have any, any final questions that they'd love to, to ask, ask Ken or the space in general? Yes, feel free to type your questions or come off mute. Um, yeah, while, while you're getting your questions in there, I'll go ahead and share some, um, some next steps that you can do is, of course, Wendy just just shared the WhatsApp, um, which Ken is also in. Um, so mm -hmm. this this continue this conversation continue can continue. Oh my goodness, beyond uh, this session today in the mm -hmm. WhatsApp group. Um, so we hope you guys to join that as well. There should be a feedback form also in your inboxes any minute now. Um, we'd love to really hear uh, your opinions on the sessions that you've attended. Um, you know, so we're, we're always looking to see how we can, you know, do even better for our next sessions and maybe even in the future sessions that we do. And, you know, um, so we would, we would really, really appreciate hearing your opinions and your feedback. Um, and I would also love to really give a shout out to our next session, um, which is on Thursday of this week. And I, I think it's such a perfect tie in um, because it's all about goal setting and goal achievement and and you know what better next step than you know once you've really thought about your vision and your dream for yourself is how to start making it really happen and how to mobilize the rest of your teams and you know get everybody on board and how to how to set goals and, and make sure that you can accomplish those dreams that you set for yourself um, so that'll be with an amazing alumnus Derek Weeks um, on on Thursday so we're really really looking forward 
forward to that session and, and we'd love to see see you guys in in that session too and of course if you if you finding value with these sessions we'd also love for you to share them with the rest of the network and make sure nobody misses out um, on more conversations that are like these these really amazing um, alumni who have agreed to participate in in these sessions it's it's been really amazing for Tuhang and I to get to participate in this way and connect to these alumni and we we really just really have a hope that you guys um, can too and you know start building your networks. <laughs> and I make a closing comment because there are two questions we got ahead of time about how do I deal with stress and tell tell about a failure. Oh perfect. Yeah. Good. One sentence each. Focus on getting something done. That is the way to overcome stress. Just do it. And a failure, I didn't do enough. And Isaac didn't do enough in the 60s. And that is a regret. And my hope is that you all don't have that regret when you look back on this decade. Make a difference. You can. You have the ability. You know more of what needs to be done than anyone else. Step up. Make a better world. <laughs> <laughs> and to, you know, the three of you who I'm looking at, Haley and Natalie and Sue Hong, thank you so much for getting me to think about long ago. It was really pretty profound for me. Mm -hmm. And for this opportunity, I appreciate it. Absolutely. Yes. We are yeah. so grateful that you were able to participate with us yes. and, and give us give us your two cents and, and share with us uh, all of your experience and quite frankly wisdom. Um, and it's it's very inspiring. I've seen all the comments here then, you know, wrapping up this chat that yes. everybody is very inspired right now. Um, and so that's that's really great to see. And I know I am and <laughs> yes. too. So um, so yeah, thank you so much, Ken. Thank you so much. We're so grateful. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we will go ahead and close off this space then, guys. Um, feel free to follow up with, with Ken or myself or Tuhong yes. or Haley or Wendy, anybody <laughs> um, with questions. Um, we'd also love to help you if you're, if you're curious about which sessions are right for you. Um, go ahead and send us a message with some of the things that you're interested in. Um, we want to we wanna help your dreams <laughs> come yes. true. So Tell us can, your dreams. We can connect you with the right sessions. Um, <laughs> you know, so um, yeah, we'd, we'd love to do that for you. So let us know any questions and thoughts that you guys have. Um, and we'll, yeah. we'll see you on Thursday, hopefully. Okay. Thanks so much, everybody. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Ken. <laughs>